Hi, this is Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop, and thanks for joining me for this edition of the Sonic Scoop podcast. Today, we're going to be talking all about avoiding audio snake oil. What exactly is audio snake oil? Probably everyone believes that there's such a thing as audio snake oil, right? Things that people are trying to sell you that don't make a difference. That's how I'm going to define snake oil. I think there's another popular audio YouTube channel out there that makes a whole bunch of videos about snake oil products. But I don't think they use that word in a way that makes sense to me. Snake oil to me is placebo. (laughs) You're basically being sold something to make you feel better that doesn't change the actual quality of your audio results. But this is actually a surprisingly nuanced topic. And to be a good skeptic, I think you have to be prepared to believe anything given the right evidence. And I think that's huge. This episode was inspired by an email that someone just sent me just the other day, regular viewer, listener of the channel, and they sent me a link and just said, hey, Justin, what do you think of this? And it was a link to a video that you may or may not have heard about out on the YouTubes by another big-ish audio channel out there. And it was a fairly respected guy, a very well-respected guy in our community who was going to bat for specialty power cables that cost a couple of hundred dollars a pop. Will they improve the sound quality plugging in a fancier power cable? And people also talk about, you know, guitar cables or mic cables or, you know, instrument cables. Will swapping those out improve the quality? Um, Swapping out things like tubes. There's all sorts of things that you can change in your audio path, going from one preamp to another. How many of these changes make any difference at all? And in the cases where they do make a difference, at what point do they make enough of a difference to justify you spending your money on them? And that's a question we're going to explore in great detail today. And I want to focus a little bit on that question of cables, power cables, guitar cables, mic cables, that kind of thing, because there's actually some nuance there. Most of the time, upgrading certain types of cables is not really going to change anything. But in some cases, some types of cables can sound different for real reasons. But how different is different enough to justify spending money? And how much money could you justify spending? And in what cases is some of this stuff just total snake oil, where you're being sold a story and not actually an improvement audio quality? I think I'm going to give you a lens today about how to navigate these questions, how to answer those questions for yourself each and every time so you can make good decisions for yourself. I'm not going to tell you what to think, but I'm going to give you, I think, a good way of thinking about this stuff. So without further ado, let's get right into it. First, big shout out to our sponsors. Biggest sponsor on this podcast is you. How do you sponsor this podcast? By smashing the like button if you're on the YouTube version or if you're listening to the audio-only version, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, I guess it's Apple Podcasts now. Consider leaving us a five-star rating and review on the podcast service of your choice. It really does help spread the word. Big thanks also to Focusrite, making some of my favorite non-snake oily great interfaces. They make some of the best bang for the buck stuff down in the Scarlet line or their median claret line, all the way up to their super high-end Rednet series. Also, another purveyor of non-snake oil products, Sound Toys, making some of my favorite creative mixing effects. So we've established already. What is snake oil? I consider snake oil basically placebo when you're being sold something, but there is no actual difference or no discernible difference. And those are two big things. You could have two different pieces of gear where there is an actual measurable distance uh, difference, but there's no discernible difference. And I want to get into that real, uh, in just a second, but real quick, I want to establish first the idea of there being no actual difference. And this is quite possible. All right. Most of you probably know how phase works if you've gotten this far into this podcast. If you don't, here's a little primer. Imagine you have a sine wave, right? If you have a sine wave and you duplicate that sine wave and flip the polarity on one of them, those two sine waves will cancel out perfectly. You can try this kind of thing even with more complex stuff. You can take uh, one of your favorite tracks, load it up into your DAW, duplicate that track, and flip the polarity on one of them. 
basically turning the waveform upside down. And if you play those two tracks together, they'll cancel out perfectly. Silence. This is called a null test. You can try this in your DAW right now if you haven't done it before. Take two of the same exact audio track, flip the polarity on one. And what's happening is now when one has a waveform going up, telling the speaker to say, move out, the other has of equal magnitude, a waveform going down, telling the speaker to move back with equal intensity. So you're giving two different signals to your speakers at the same time. One saying, go forward this hard, and the other saying, no, go back this hard. So what does the speaker do? It just stays still, and there's no noise. And that's how a null test works. And you can use a null test to decide if there is no difference at all between signals, and if there is a difference, where that difference may lie. A lot of people get a little superstitious about sample rates, and I've done some articles on sample rates and a YouTube video here on sample rates that kind of demystifies a lot of it, because a lot of people are under this mistaken impression, I'd say, around sample rates, that if you go up to a higher and higher sample rate, you're going to affect the audio quality throughout the entire audio spectrum. And that's actually just not true, and you can prove this to yourself with a null test. You can record something at a sample rate of, say, 88.2, and then duplicate it, as a 44.1 sample rate waveform. And you can bring those two waveforms into the same session at the higher sample rate and flip the polarity on one. And what you'll find is complete perfect cancellation all the way down below what's called the Nyquist frequency. That's the highest frequency you can replicate at a certain sample rate. So if you're recording something at a sample rate of 88.2K, that means the highest frequency you can reproduce is something like 44.1K. And if you're recording something at 44.1K sample rate, the highest frequency you can reproduce is something like 22K, right? And you'll find that if you take these two identical files where everything is the same except for the sample rate, it will null completely below that highest cutoff point. And you'll see and hear that the only differences between those two files happen above that Nyquist frequency, the highest frequency you can record or reproduce. In this case, something like 22K. Below 22K, the two audio waveforms sound identical. Above it, that's where there are differences that don't get canceled out in the null test. Now, there are actual caveats to this stuff. And I want to be a little bit nuanced because sometimes when people say they hear differences, they really do hear differences. And sometimes that's because there's an actual discernible difference to be heard. And sometimes it's because of a very powerful effect that we'll get into in just a second. So here are the caveats. One particular given converter that you record with or interface, the way it's designed, it might actually sound slightly better recording at 88.2K instead of 44.1K. It might sound better at a higher sample rate. But there would be reasons for that other than the sample rate. It could very well be that the filter, every single converter needs a filter to get rid of the high frequency stuff, extra high frequency stuff that can't be reproduced. It could very well be that the filter that they're using sounds better at a higher sample rate than a lower sample rate. It's not designed very well so that you get this sloping effect and maybe you lose some high frequency or maybe you get a resonant peak. But there's some reason other than the sample rate that that particular converter of yours actually does sound discernibly better at 88.2 than 44.1K. So that could happen. Absolutely. But I don't think that's what's happening in most cases. We'll get to that in a second. Especially not today anymore. Another thing could happen where you could be comparing this new converter that you got and you're running it at 192 or 96K or whatever, and it sounds better than your old converter at 44.1K or 48K. But what you're hearing, the differences you're hearing, are not differences in sample rate. They could be differences in the filters, again, like we talked about. Going deeper into that will require another podcast episode. But it could also be a difference in the analog front end of that piece of hardware. And that is often a big thing. Take some of my favorite converters around. They're not sponsored this podcast, but it should be for me saying so. But Burl make wonderful sounding converters. But the actual conversion in a Burl converter is not necessarily significantly better than a much cheaper converter. What is wonderful sounding in particular is the analog front end 
that the signal has to pass through. And if you compare that to other converters, it's going to have its own sound and a sound that is discernible and a sound that you're not just fooling yourself into hearing a difference. Because I've done double blind tests where I've been able to pick the Burl converters out from other converters. And I've done that with other converters as well. The Lavery converters that we use at Joe Lambert Mastering, when I was mostly mastering on a really fancy hybrid analog digital system, those converters had a sound. And what was coming back off of those converters after going through them was different than what I was putting into them. So they had a sound. And a good sound, a really pleasing one. But in many cases... When you're comparing two things, it's not necessarily that the thing that you like better actually sounds truer to the original source. It often sounds less true to the original source in a way that you like better. And that's a big thing to recognize. A lot of the high-end stuff that we get isn't necessarily cleaner, especially when we're talking about digital capture devices. We're talking about two microphones or mic preamps. Yeah, the higher end piece, maybe it has lower noise. uh, Maybe it's cleaner, all of that stuff. But that only comes up to a certain point. At a certain point, a lot of the super fancy high end stuff we like, we like because it messes up the sound in a way that's cool. And there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, that's the whole goal of mixing. What is mixing but creatively applying distortion of every kind. I don't just mean total harmonic distortion. You could think of more metaphorically, metaphysically, when you EQ something, you're distorting in a way. You're distorting the frequency response. I know I'm kind of mixing terms together here, but in a abstract sense, what is mixing? But applying distortion, making things sound less like the pure original sounds in a way that's aesthetically pleasing. And this is a big thing with the the debate that used to happen in Fortunately, it doesn't happen that much anymore between digital and vinyl. People are finally getting hip to it. Something I've been talking about for a decade when people weren't hip to it and they'd say, oh, vinyl just sounds better. And it's like, what do you mean by sounds better? Because if you mean that the vinyl record sounds closer to the mix that you were getting into the studio, it doesn't. So by that standard, it sounds objectively worse, right? A vinyl record compared to a digital capture off of the cheapest interface you can buy at the store, the cheapest interface you can buy at the music store is going to give you a more accurate reproduction, most likely, than a really well-cut vinyl record. The super cheap $90 interface will probably sound more like the original source you're recording than a really well-cut vinyl record. However, that vinyl record might have a sound that's degraded in ways that are pleasing. What'll happen with vinyl records is they might not sound quite as wide. The bass might get a little tighter, a little leaner. There might be some extra noise. But all of those things might be pleasing to you. A, because it's a sound you're used to. If you grew up listening in vinyl records, I don't think that's as much of an issue with people who are listening to this uh, anymore. Or it could just sound degraded in a way that's familiar or cool or different, or you notice a change. And sometimes when you notice a change and you have a story in your head about how this new change is supposed to be better, it'll sound better. Because you're hearing a change and you associate that change with better. So it sounds better to you. And a vinyl record really does sound different than a digital capture by a little bit. So there is a discernible difference, but there's also a discernible difference that is arguably objectively worse, but to you, it might be subjectively better. Give you a quick analogy. When I was growing up as a kid, I was a Star Wars nerd. Many people my age are. I'm not really a Star Wars nerd anymore. New Star Wars has come out and I'm like, eh. Although I remember a period in my late teens or even twenties when I was like, when are they going to come out with a new Star Wars? And they started coming out with new Star Wars, and I was like, ah, I guess I'm done. (laughs) Maybe you can relate, maybe you can't. But I was a big fan. I mean, I had these VHS copies of all of the Star Wars movies dubbed off of television, like with the old toothpaste commercials and the old car commercials where you could see like that a car that cost $40,000 today was like $6,000. And it's like, whoa, that's weird. Thanks, inflation. Anyway... Those Star Wars movies on those VHS tapes taped off of TV 
looked great to me. Like I was transported watching those things to this other mythical dimension. And then eventually I got the remastered DVDs. And forget about all the CGI stuff they added. Forget about that for a second. But even like the original stuff, there were like boxes around the spaceships all of a sudden. They cleaned them up so good that you could see all of the issues and all of the flaws in the special effects of the day. And like that noise and in a way distortion that you had on the video picture made them seem much more seamless and in a way more realistic and engaging and I was more willing to suspend my disbelief. So there are times where making things sound or look worse makes them sound or look better subjectively. So that's a big thing worth acknowledging. I still, I promise I'm going to get into how to tell whether or not you're getting served snake oil. But there are really two ways. One, you want to discover if there's any difference at all. And the way to do that is with a null test, which is what we talked about earlier. A null test will show you if a difference exists. You'll never really get a false negative on a null test. Like if there's no difference and you see that there's no difference in the null test, the null test is right. There's no difference. But you could actually do a null test between two different devices, two different components, and get the sense that there might be a difference where there isn't really a difference. Because the world is imperfect. Let's say we wanted to put this idea of a high-end power cable that costs $300, making your amp sound better to the test. It's actually a little tricky to do a null test, especially if you're trying to figure out its effect on speakers or amplifiers. I mean, the closest you could do is say if you wanted to have a guitar player do a null test with the fancy $300 cable and without it. The bad thing you could do, which is actually what this particular company that will remain nameless did on their channel originally, was they had a guitar player sit down, play some stuff with one cable plugged in. He played some licks, and then they plugged in the new magical $300 cable, and he played some more licks. He actually played different licks, and he's like, you know how much more low end there is? And like the riff he's playing, he's on the lower strings with more low end. It's like, how am I supposed to judge anything? The closest we could get is if you have one person pre-record a guitar part and then put a microphone in front of that speaker and then play that pre-recorded guitar part through the speaker with the one cable and then play it again through the speaker into the mic with the other cable. Then load both of those identical performances with identical mic placement and everything else up into the DAW, reverse the polarity in one and do a null test. But even that might not be perfect. You could still get a false positive. I mean, what if you're moving the speaker ever so slightly while you're plugging in the new cable? I mean, things like humidity. I mean, this is now a physical device. We're not just talking about electronics. Does the speaker move in precisely the same way every time it's sent what is basically the same electrical signal? Probably. But could there be tiny variations in it? based on time of day, humidity, like an inch movement, there's a chance you might get really close to a null if they were exactly the same, but not perfectly to a null. Or, just for argument's sake, maybe there actually would be a difference. What is that threshold for where you say there's a difference? And it's probably not just random chance in the air because this is a fairly complex and imperfect test to do. I mean, that's subjective. But that's the kind of test you'd want to do to first see if there's some chance that there's an actual difference at all. And once you've established, is there some chance there's an actual difference at all? Then you want to get into the world of discernibility. Meaning, if there's a difference, is it a difference significant enough to hear? And there are some cases where those differences may exist. Another good example involving a guitar player is some guitar cables actually sound different. 
as much of an audio skeptic and a snake oil phobe as I am, I've got to admit, if you take a like monster bass cable, super thick gauge and a short cable and plug that in from a guitar into an amp, and it's like a six foot cable, it will sound one way. And then if you take a little old Jimi Hendrix style spirally cable, like a really thin 1960s style guitar cable, maybe it's an even long one, a really long one to make the test even dif- uh, different. There's going to be differences in inductance, capacitance, resistance, and those two cables might sound different. And that monster bass cable that costs $50 may very well have more low end and a brighter, chimier top end, like there might be more clarity um, and if you then switch to like the 1960s style guitar cable with its higher impedance, you might really get a mid rangier sound with less top end on it. It might sound tighter and more forward. And you would hear these changes and be like, oh, these guitar cables totally sound different. And someone's going to say, oh, that's snake oil. One cable is the same as another. But you could A, do a null test and you'll find that there are differences, maybe in noise, maybe in frequency response. And then you would want to, on top of that, do some kind of discernibility test to say, well, we know that there's a difference now, but how significant is it? Is it worth spending $50 more? And the best kind of discernibility test that exists today is called an ABX test. An ABX test works like this. And you can Google ABX test. There's ABX testers you can get for both Mac or PC and do some stuff like this on your own home computer. In addition, you already know how to do a null test. We went over that. You can do one of these ABX tests. Here's how it works. You take one audio file. It's A. You take another audio file. It's B. You listen to both of them as many times as you want. And then there's another audio file, X. And you have to guess, which one is X? Is it A or is it B? To make sure you understand this, I'll give an example. Let's pretend we were trying to train to, to hear if we could tell the difference between whether or not a vocal had reverb on it. My mom could probably do that one, and I don't think she can hear above 9K because she's in her 70s. Okay, here's what we would do. Clip A is a dry vocal. Clip B has like mega 80s reverb on it that anyone could hear. <laughs> and you could listen back and forth to these and say, okay, that's what a vocal sounds like with reverb and without reverb. And now you do... X, and you hear it and say, which one is that? Was it A, the dry one, or B, the one with reverb? And it's like, my my two-year-old toddler could tell you this one. She's going to pass the <laughs> ABX test with flying colors. Clearly, that was B, because it sounded like a really bad 1980s record with way too much reverb on the vocal. So that's an ABX test. So obviously, that concept m- works and makes sense. People get annoyed with ABX tests, though, when it shows that they can't hear the differences that they thought they could hear. And different people have different results with ABX tests. That's another thing to recognize. There have been good peer-reviewed studies where you take a whole bunch of musicians and you play them CD quality sound, and then you play them pretty low res, 128 kilobits per second MP3, a 128 K MP3 compared to a full resolution, you know, CD quality sound wave file. And it's pretty much random chance. The musicians can't tell the difference between the full resolution file and the MP3. But then you give the same test to audio engineers, and now all of a sudden, well, it depends on exactly what the bit rates are, but maybe somewhere between 60 and 80% of these trained audio engineers are hearing the difference between those two. I mean, I can get generally, you know, five out of five right all day long on an ABX test between full resolution audio and 128 kilobits per second. Every once in a while, I might get one wrong because I, I I heard a, a difference and, you know, I was like, oh, I got that one wrong. I was listening for the wrong thing. So it can it can happen to me. I can get those wrong. I mean, I have to admit that today, MP3 codecs have come so far that every once in a while, mastering engineer, trained critical listening, I'll get some of them wrong occasionally at 128. Musicians will get them wrong pretty much all the time. It's just random as chance and something like, you know, 80%, I don't know, of audio engineers will usually get them right. But as you go up and up and up in bitrate, 
fewer and fewer and fewer people can get them right. So that when you get up to 320 kilobits per second, pretty much the highest resolution MP3s we have, pretty much no one in the world yet that we know of has documented that they can hear a difference between a 320 kilobits per second MP3 and any higher resolution file that it was made from. There's just no one who's done it on record. That doesn't mean it can't be done, but I first put an article out about this, man, years ago. I'll have to look it up, but you can look it up yourself. Take the Golden Ears Challenge, it was called. Can you hear the difference between a 320 kilobits file and a high resolution file? And if you do, I'll write a glowing article about you in our publications in Sonic Scoop, my publication back then, Trust Me, I'm a Scientist, it was facetiously titled. I'll wrote, write a feature article about you and how you're the first person to be able to show that they can hear a difference because you climbed audio Mount Everest. No one has proven they've done this before. And as someone who is willing to be skeptical, I also have to keep an open mind to be a good skeptic. So I'm never going to say that it can't be done and it will never be done. You know, they told the Wright brothers they could never fly and then they flew and they were like, ha ha, sucks to be you. So maybe someday someone will document that, hey, 10 out of 10 or even 9 out of 10 times, not cherry picking. I didn't take the test like 20 times and then I cherry picked the one time I got 9 out of 10, right? someone really shows that they can consistently hear a difference between 320 kilobits per second and a higher resolution, I'll still do it. Golden Ears Challenge is still out there. If you can show that you can, in a, under double blind conditions, where you don't know which file is which, and the person administering the test doesn't know which file is which, then I would still write a feature article about you, maybe have you as a guest on the podcast. I would think that would be super impressive. Spoiler alert, I actually haven't done this test myself uh, because I I want to, I, I don't want to lose. <laughs> I want to think that like, oh, maybe I would be the person who could do it. And the best way to to go to the grave thinking I could maybe do it is to never try, right? But I'll tell you a test I did do so that people could get this idea. I wrote an article, and this was back when Neil Young was pushing for a Pono player, a high-resolution audio player. He wanted to get people hooked on. I had my readers, generally total audio nerds, especially at that point. And I gave them the high-resolution audio file, the original full-resolution audio file of a project I had worked on, and a MP3 version of it. And it wasn't even 320 kilobits per second. I think it was only like 256 or something. And I said, can you hear the difference between these two? And I put that out to my readers. And when I was listening back and forth to them in a sighted listening test, where I knew which one was the high resolution 24 bit one and which one was the, the lower resolution, I think it was 256 kilobits MP3. When I knew the difference, I was like, oh my goodness, I'm coming out here making the case that most people aren't going to hear the difference. And here I am hearing the difference between the two files. Clearly, the 24 bit one sounds better than the 256 one. And I mean, there's this obvious difference in like how open it is and like this thing I'm hearing in the bass and there's a little bit of extra detail in the upper mid range on it. And compared to this MP3 version, like there really, there really is a significant difference. And people are going to, how am I going out there saying most people can't hear the difference and my audience is going to hear this and we're going to prove it wrong. And I, it was like a dilemma. And then I renamed the file so I didn't know which was which, mixed them up, and put them in a random way where I couldn't tell which file was which. And all of those differences I was so sure I heard disappeared. They completely vanished. As soon as I was listening to them in a double blind way, in a blind way, where I didn't know which one was which, I was ready to hang my hat on these sonic differences and sure I could pick them out. But they like vanished into the ether. And that is because as powerful as our ears are, and our ears can be pretty powerful. I can pick out some things I think are pretty impressive. There are other people who can pick out things much more impressive than me. I remember being in the room with a mixing engineer who was like, oh, that's a d delay time is probably more like uh, 65 milliseconds. And it's like, whoa, bang on, you know? Um, and 
I was guessing them, you know, what the delay times were at a much wider threshold than this mixing engineer who was really a delay specialist and delay lover uh, could pick them out. And he was getting them so much more precisely and so much closer when we were trying to guess delay times. He did it much better. I was like, wow, you know, maybe if I practiced that more, I could get better at naming the exact delay time within a dense mix. So there are people who can hear really impressive, you know, subtle differences. Oh, that's not... 60 milliseconds is 65 milliseconds. How, how would you even hear it? I'm probably exaggerating slightly. But as powerful as our ears are, our minds and the stories we tell ourselves are even more powerful still. There's just absolutely no question about that. I'm going to say it again because it bears repeating. As powerful as our ears are, our minds are even more powerful still. So I did put out this test. If you Google Justin Coletti, Neil Young, or Justin Coletti, Pono, something like that, you'll probably find where I, I put out that test. You can still do it for yourself these days. And I'll tell you what the results were from our audience. And this was an audience that could have cheated if they wanted to, because they could download both files, load them up into their DAW, all that stuff. And they were an audience of complete audio nerds. It was exactly 50-50. So no better than chance. Our audio nerd audience, who could have cheated if they wanted to, couldn't tell the difference. And that happened at a very low sample size. It was like the first hundred responses that came in, it was like 49.5 versus, you know, 50.5. And then as we got to, you know, 500 responses and a thousand, it's like dead 50. And it's been dead 50, even when new results have come in later. It's still just been 50-50. People couldn't tell the difference. And this is only between a 24-bit WAV file and like a 256. So it's not even the highest res you can get in an mp3. And this does not mean that there aren't differences between a 24-bit WAV file and a 256 kilobits per second mp3 file, because there are. But those differences may or may not be discernible to you. And that's the ultimate person that this comes down to, is you. What's your threshold for discernibility? Does this purchase make sense to you? If you're debating between a $300 purchase where you can't really discern the difference when you listen to it in a careful way versus another $300 purchase where you can discern a difference clearly, then you know which one to get. And you know how to test things now for discernibility. These are the two things. One, is there an actual difference? Do a null test. You flip the phase. You find out a way to structure that null test. So you can draw as many variables as possible, and then you can see how well do these things null? Is there a difference at all? If there's no difference at all, you can say it's snake oil. If there is a difference, great, but is it a discernible difference? And the way to find that out, the best way that I know of, is a double-blind listening test called an ABX test. And again, there are apps, you can, some free ones even for both Mac and PC, where you can do some ABX testing of yourself. And ask yourself, is there a discernible difference to me? So, I'm open to the idea that different guitar cables could sound different. Prove it to me. Or, better yet, I can prove it to myself. And here's another question. You may find the two different guitar cables sound different at the extremes, like the super thick monster cable versus the super skinny 1960s guitar cable. But that doesn't mean that the more expensive, super thick, fancy cable is going to sound better to you than the super skinny cable. You might like the tight, constrained sound of the higher resistance super skinny cable over the wider, thicker one. And as you get closer and closer, where we're not dealing with cables at the exact opposite ends of the spectrum, but, you know, somewhere more in the happy middle, maybe the differences are so tiny that who cares? And I'm open to the idea that a power cable could change, because if the argument is that, hey, there's a wider gauge of power cables in your house, and then you're using a smaller gauge of power cable going to your speaker or your amplifier, 
that could be the bottleneck. That's the argument of this, you know, fancy cable company. I haven't tested their stuff, so I'm not going to comment on it. They claim to have done null, null tests. I think there are null tests, uh, visual results from them on their website. Like I've said, it's difficult to do a null test if you're testing like a speaker super perfectly. Doing a different kind of device would be much easier to do a null test on. But I'll tell you that even if you had the same result where you did a null test and you found that there was maybe some actual difference, you'd want to do a real double-blind listening test to find out if there's a discernible difference. Not one where you're playing two different guitar licks, right? And not one where it's sighted. And this is another big thing. If you know which one is which, you will hear differences that aren't really there because you can tell yourself a story and your stories are more powerful than your ears, as powerful as your ears might be. And also, if the person who is testing you knows, man, we are so good, as good as we are about picking up on tiny audio differences if you've trained for it, we're much better at picking up on like facial expressions, body posture, like the stuff that has been deeply connected to our survival <laughs> throughout our time on earth here as a species. And the tester can very much lead you in the direction of choosing one thing or another, even if the two things are identical. And if you sit down in the room together with a purveyor of the snake oil, and they know which is which, and all of a sudden they're like this when the second one comes on, and you have this thing inside of you they're not even conscious of that's like, ooh, I want to yeah, I want to be on the same wavelength with this person. I'm grooving with them. I'm hanging out with them. And I'm like, yeah, now I'm going to loosen up too. Oh, there's... And you're all of a sudden picking up on their little cues of body language. You can all of a sudden tell yourself the story again. That's super powerful. Now, the last thing I want to say around this idea that I've been dancing around is placebo, right? This is what it is when we can tell ourselves a story. And the story being more powerful is about placebo. And placebo works like this. You may have heard of it. We're testing one medication on you to see if it makes you feel better. But compared to what? Because we find that if we give people a sugar pill that doesn't actually do anything, a placebo pill, there's a good chance that they'll feel better. So you can say that 30% of people, their back pain went away when we gave them this pill. But if you gave an equal number of people, similar background, a completely inert pill with nothing in it, a placebo pill, and 30% of them, their back feels better too, who cares, right? But with that said, I want to be even nuanced here. Placebos can be useful. What if I could give you nothing and a story and all of a sudden you felt better and your back pain went away and you started making better records with more confidence and all of that? So I guess there's a market for placebo. But that said, it's also sensible to make sure you're putting your money, your resources, your time, your brain power in places that will get you the big wins. And yeah, telling yourself a better story, if your bad story is what's holding you back, telling yourself a better story maybe could be a big win for you. But what if you could tell yourself a better story that was also true and that also gave you like clearly superior results when you put it to the test? Wouldn't that be a better place to put your resources? And some people do get annoyed when I bring up a placebo because they were so sure. And I, audio engineers who I respect so much, we've done amazing sounding records, better record sounding records than I've done. We'll get into some conversation. And I'm like, oh, I'm not going to use the, the placebo word. I'm not going to push it. But there is a placebo thing going on sometimes. And people don't like to be told that they are susceptible to the placebo effect because they feel like you're telling them that they're gullible and they feel like you're telling them that their experience doesn't matter and they shouldn't trust their experience. Well, actually, sometimes you shouldn't trust your experience. <laughs> your experience is often a good guide. 
but sometimes your experience will lead you in the wrong direction because we have cognitive biases. We have things in our brains. We're not robots. We have things in our brains that if you were to design a brain, I guess from the ground up, you wouldn't put in there, right? And the placebo effect is one of them. It happens to every single one of us. We've all had the experience of playing around with an EQ. We're boosting 5K. We think it sounds a little bit better, but it's not getting us quite what we need. So we boosted some more. We're like, that's a little bit better, but it's not as dramatic as I wanted. So you turn the knob all the way up and you're like, oh, the EQ was off. But you were sure you were hearing a difference. That happens to all of us. It happens to the most golden-eared person out there. It's like a totally human thing. And to recognize that we have this in us is not gullible. What's gullible is to not recognize that you have that in you. To fight and say, no, you're trying to say that I have this totally normal human condition? (laughs) You're trying to tell me that I am mortal? You're trying to tell me that I'm just like everybody else? Yes! Yes, because you are. We all are. Being offended if someone brings up placebo as a possibility is like being offended that someone suggests that you might have to use the bathroom at some point in your life. Like, it's just part of the organism. It's just what we do. Just because you have to sometimes use the bathroom doesn't make you a bad person. doesn't make you dirty. It makes you a person, right? Same with placebo effect. Being susceptible to it means like you're not dead. (laughs) You're a living human being. And the more comfortable you are with saying, I can be misled, the less often you're going to be misled. Because if you immediately push back when someone's saying, oh, I'm not sure about that. I'm a bit skeptical. And you say, uh, you're, you don't have the experience I do and you should try it for yourself. And I sat there with a the guy and we listened to him, and we heard the difference. And if you're just going there instead of going to, you know, you might be right. It might have been placebo or something, but it seemed to be better. Then you can, at a certain point, make a judgment. One of those potential judgments is, well, I don't really care. It might have been placebo, but it seems to work. So I'm going to keep on going with it. Sound better to me. And that's what we do all the time within mixing, within mastering even. Sometimes I make these quarter dB changes in, you know, an EQ setting while I'm mastering. Did I make it sound better? Probably, I think so. But is that one quarter dB change that I made the thing that makes the master work or not work? I'll tell you that every time I make a quarter dB EQ change and I think I can hear the difference and probably really can hear the difference in many cases, depending on the level and where it is and other factors. Are, there are contexts in which you can hear a quarter dB EQ change and contexts in which you can't. And I'm sure that if we do some ABX testing, there'll be contexts in which, oh yeah, I picked out the quarter dB change and contexts in which you're like, oh, I didn't and I'm just fooling myself. It doesn't really matter because it's not about getting the right perfect quarter dB change Like there are many cases in the mixes that you've been working on, the masters you've been doing, where you could have made a quarter dB or a half dB change in the other direction. And because of all the other things that are going on in your process, it doesn't really matter. That change was counteracted by something else you were doing, an EQ you were doing somewhere else or compression you were doing somewhere else. Or it's just such a small change that you could have had a great master that sounded ever so slightly different or a great mix that sounded ever so so slightly different if you took all of your quarter dB changes and reversed them. But when we're actually working, we don't want to stop ourselves and second guess everything and go... Where am I really hearing the difference on the half dB change I made? Let me stop here. I just EQ the vocal. I went up a half a dB at 4K. Does it really sound better? Let me put it into an ABX tester and see if I can find out whether I can actually hear that half dB difference on this vocal. Oh, very interesting. Well, I think I got it. Okay, that was four out of five times I got it right. So maybe uh, I could actually hear that difference. That was a useful one to make. Thank you, ABX. No! <laughs> no, one, no one should work that way. You just do it. And it's like, it sounds better? Uh great. Let's keep going. Does, does it sound better? Uh, great. Let's keep going. Sometimes you might make changes that didn't actually make a real difference, but it seemed like the right change to make and you stick with it and you just move on. And that is what people who are resistant to all this placebo stuff and skepticism stuff. And, you know, they don't want to be scared. They're very incredulous and they're very kind of, you know, spiritually non sciencey people when they're working have right. They have absolutely right that you shouldn't be going about mixing or mastering or even recording in a super scientific way. Science 
And this logic and this reason is for evaluating problems when they come up. If you really need to figure out what the exact problem is, there are very systematic ways to troubleshoot where you can find out an exact problem. But even being completely scientific and systematic is not always the best thing to do in this situation. You're at a recording session and there's some problem. What's the most important thing to do? Like there's a, a, your vocal channel. It's not coming through properly. Is the most important thing to do to troubleshoot every single point in your audio chain and figure out where the breakdown is, whether it's the cable between the microphone and the interface, or whether it's the cable between the interface and the patch bay, or whether it's the cable between the, the patch bay and uh, something else. Do we need to find out exactly what ca cable is wrong, or you just pull them all <laughs> and put in a bunch of new ones and like done? You know, maybe that's faster. Maybe changing two cables. It could be this, because of how it's happening, it could be this cable or this cable. Let's just take them both out and change them both and we'll leave figuring out for later. There are times to not be scientific. A time to be scientific, I think, is when you want to make large purchases for your studio about things that may or may not confer some small benefit and where there are very mixed perspectives about whether it matters at all. In those cases, so you best spend your resources on the things that are going to give you the most bang for the buck, and you can respect the 80-20 rule of audio engineering. Check that out. That's one of my most popular episodes of this podcast, where you're really going after the big wins instead of chasing minutia. In those cases, maybe you do the null test, the double-blind listening, to figure out once and for all, what sample rate should I really be working at? Does it really matter to me? Um, should I really buy a whole bunch of these new cables for my studio? That kind of thing. And then do the test yourself to see if one, there's an actual difference and two, a difference that you can discern. And if you can discern it, how significant it is. Or it's your life. You can totally ignore that advice and just hear a good story. And if the story makes you feel more positive and makes you more confident in the studio and you want to spend money on things that other people are going to think is wasteful and they're going to give you all these scientific arguments for why it's wasteful, who cares? It's not their money. It's not their life. So you have my permission to ignore everything I just said because you don't need my permission. It's not your life. It's not my life. Do whatever you want. But that's my perspective on it. And I think a perspective that's going to help you. Well, I hope this one was useful for you. If you liked it, smash the like button on the uh, YouTube version of this podcast or the audio-only versions. Five-star ratings and reviews are greatly, greatly appreciated. Also, more stuff for free that I want to give you. Mastering Workshop called Mastering 101. Free workshop. It is about the ins and outs of mastering. Everything you need to know about mastering if you're coming into mastering, not knowing how to do it, not knowing what's going to do for you, not knowing how it should really be done, check it out, Mastering 101. That's sonicscoop.com slash Mastering 101. sonicscoop.com slash Mastering 101. Or you can check out the five habits of truly great mixers, another free workshop at sonicscoop.com slash mix habits. That's sonicscoop.com slash mix habits. Try either or both of those. People seem to like them a lot. Also, big, big thanks to our sponsors. Once again, sponsors like Focusrite, making their wonderful, totally non-snake oily, excellent audio interfaces. I am talking into one right now. Oh my goodness. Somehow a fly got into my studio. Did I tell you I'm doing these podcasts totally live now? So I, I hope that that fly buzzing, unless I take it out in post, uh, came through in sterling audio quality, thanks to this uh, Focusrite interface. Also, Sound Toys, making some of my favorite creative mixing effects that are not snake oil at all because they actually sound like stuff. Again, my definition of snake oil being doesn't really do anything. Sound Toys plugins, they do something. They do a lot. And I hope you enjoy them. You can try out anything they make for free at soundtoys.com. Thanks for hanging out with me. This has been Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop. You've been tuning into the Sonic Scoop podcast. I hope you join me again sometime. Till next time, thanks for hanging out with me. See you next time.